foresight to intervene uh, to save me. But at this particular time, we would like to give to Professor Booker T. Coleman our United African Movement wristwatch for the effort that he has given to the United African Movement. Professor Booker T. Coleman. All right, giving out gifts. I like this. Thank you. I know I'll know what time it is now. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. And thank you to the United African Movement. As I've said so many times, it is so wonderful to be with Africans that are united and moving because so many are standing still. And it's so important that we realize and understand and to remove the cobwebs from our eyes and to wake up. And of course, here at Slave Theater, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted. But there's always room to grow. And that is what our ancestors spoke about when they used to write many, many thousands of years ago. And when our children begin to understand exactly what carbon dating is, we'll go back a couple of million years. They're already talking about the pyramids going back 10,000 years. And I'm telling you, when all is said and done, we're going to go back so far, we will have pyramids built on pyramids. There are so many African civilizations built over the African civilizations that we say are ancient today. It is so important for us to understand as a people what our ancestors have done. I would like to say I'm awe-inspired by what I learned, but as I go along, while I am impressed, I'm not surprised. Because, my brothers and sisters, for us to still be here on this planet, in this part of the world, is such a testament to resilience and brilliance and love. You know, they say when you, f you can only find your strength when you find your weakness, and I think that's very true. And as an African people, while our weakness may be love, that is also our strength. It's that, it's that feeling, it's that spirit, it's that energy that Bob Bali talks about when he talks about the fire within us, the fire that can never be put out. They're wondering how we're still here. They're wondering how we still could survive. But when you look at the works and the lives of people such as William Leo Hansberry and Harriet Tubman, when you look at those who have gone before us, those who are amongst us today as our brother Alton Maddox, you come to understand. Let's give our brother a round of applause. You come to understand that they ain't seen nothing yet. In the research that we have done looking at the comedic origins of the universe, it led me to look at the Dogon people of Mali. What a brilliant people they are. Absolutely and sheer brilliance. And what was so wonderful about these people is that they weren't the only people. Because in this area, you have the Miankara, you have the Bozo, you have the Bambara. You have a number of different civilizations all around this area, but not just that. You have it on the west coast. You have it on the southern coast. You have the Monomotapan Empire of South Africa. You have the Kuba of Central Africa. You had the pleasure and the privilege of having someone whom I admire greatly, Dr. Theophile Obenga, who much of our work that we have worked on comes from him. I sat at that brother's feet when he came to CCNY for the first time. Dr. Jeffries and others knew how important his work was to my research, so they let me go up to the Black Studies Department when Dr. Theophile Obenga came for the first time that I knew of. And we sat for a half an hour and we began to talk and compare notes and in his English and in my partial French, we came to understand that everything that Einstein ever represented had already been known amongst African folk thousands of years ago. Einstein died saying he was looking for something that already existed in the comedic origins of the waters of Nun. The Dogon people are so heavy. You've got brilliant, 
brilliant or so-called brilliant astronomers of other persuasions who in finding out what the Dogon knew about Sirius and about its companion star Sirius B, when they found out the level of knowledge that the Dogon had, what they considered to be a simple people. But you see, that's the beauty about African folk. And that's the brilliance and the beauty about intelligence and consciousness. Because the deeper you get, the more brilliant you get, the simpler everything gets. And the only time you make things complex is when you don't understand it in the first place. And when it really profounds you, you begin to speak in foreign languages to let people know you really aren't as ignorant as you really are. It's not that hard. Knowledge is not hard. Education is fun. It is not the fun that makes you go around the way we consider fun to be. It's not a day in Disneyland. But it certainly is a day within the minds and the set minds of our ancestors. The kinds of consciousness that African people looked for was the kind of feelings that we get when we sit in places such as the slave theater. That is what consciousness was. It's that feeling that sends shivers up your spine. When you find out something you always knew, but you find out that someone else knows it too. And that's what makes you applaud. It's the God force coming together. This is what knowledge was. This is what knowledge is. And once our young people get this, they will do in classrooms what Michael Jordan does on the basketball court. On Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays, I spend my time in schools in the Bronx, and I teach this to our children, and I monitor their progress, and I look at what they do and what they feel and the things that they say to me. I would like to say that it's me because my ego comes in sometimes, but I'm telling you it's the information. Our children are finding out about themselves. I have had children in classrooms that forget the bell rang for lunch. Now when that happens, you know something's up. I have children who have said that when they find this information out, they look at everything differently. They hold everybody accountable for being intelligent. Because if you are my teacher and you getting paid, well you better be putting something down on me. When I know something you don't know, then maybe we need to switch places and you need to give me your paycheck. Right. This information is very real. This information is very exhaustive also. And it is because of that, that this evening's presentation, while it is independent in and of itself, it will also be directly related to another presentation that I will be giving on March 16th at First World Alliance. There is just too much information and I did not want to come before you and present this in such an abbreviated form that you didn't get the full flavor of some of the things that I have found out about our ancestors. At the same time, I did not want to spend hours and hours developing knowledge without giving you a break to think about it because you need time to think about some of this because this is awe-inspiring. Our ancestors were a very brilliant people, but what makes them so wonderful is that they were simple. And simple in a sense, not the simple in the English language. I always think of Malcolm when he talks about English as being a language of liars. <laughs> and it is. English is the kind of language that you can say something and not mean a word you say. And sometimes on purpose, and other times you just can't help it. Because if I used the word borrow with you, you wouldn't know if I meant to borrow a hole, the borough of Brooklyn, or the animal that's a borough. You can't help but lie when you use the word borough. But you must know the context in which I'm speaking to understand. In Africa, you wouldn't have one sound with three meanings. But you could have the verse. You could have 
uh, the sound differ with three meanings. And that was the birth of the talking drum. We are a tonal people. Am I right? We say that's bad. But if I say to you that's bad, there's a difference between bad and bad. And when my body gets into it, it's badder than bad. That's the metaphor. And that's why I respect our young people so much, because they're vibing on the metaphor. Yes, I'm kind of concerned about some of the things I hear in rap music, but I'm more concerned about the society that has created conditions to have our young people speak that way. Because I've never heard a word Luther Campbell has said that I have not heard an adult speak. It's like a tape recorder. How are you going to speak into a tape recorder and our children are the cassette? How can you talk into a tape recorder, play it back, and they get angry at the cassette tape? When you hear our children, that's us. But that's us today. That's us today because we didn't do anything yesterday to make today different. And so what we've got to do is give our young people something to rap about other than what they see because there's no word that I've heard that they created. What I have heard is a creative metaphor. And this evening's presentation is going to talk about figurative language because if we are to wrestle with this so-called mystery of the African peoples, it is we must learn figurative language because our people speak figuratively. It's called amongst the African folk hitting a straight line with a curved stick. It is the ability to say something but vibing on something else to make that understood so you don't say it directly. That is the Western world. They're very literal. When they say something, that's what they say. But now there's a contradiction in what I just said because in speaking English, they're lying from the get. So what you say is not what you say. What you say is what you want me to think you say. And therefore, we live in a world of confusion, and we are a simple people with great and magnificent intelligence. So when you're sane in an insane society, the only way you can go is insane. Because you're not going to make what's insane sane. So what do you do? You break away from the insanity and you create a sane nation. And that's what we must do. And the strength that I come before you with, my beloved slave community, is not what I believe, but what I've seen happen with our young people. Our young people are ready. I've not gone on programs telling what we do because I'm a student of John Henry Clark who teaches us that we can do anything we want to as long as we don't run in the street and tell people what we're doing. You see, that's another part of us. We're so happy that we got something. We forget where we are. So we want to run out and share what we know. Nothing wrong with that. That's what created the great African nations. But we're not in Africa. So you got to know where you are. When it was time to talk in Africa, we talked and we created great nations. But that's not where we are right now. We're not on the banks of happy. We need to understand what it is we have to do. And we have to support the United African Movement. Right. My brothers and sisters, it is so clear. It is so clear where we must go. I would love to say and believe that I will get there, but I don't think I'll live to see it. When I say that, I mean I plan on living to be 150. I'm not saying that I plan on leaving any time early. What I am saying is that this is a process. Our ancestors on the plantation who knew they'd never see their freedom did what they did knowing that somewhere down the line somebody would. So what we must do is live in their light and plan for our future understanding that we may not see what we want 
but we are part of a road map that one day will emancipate and liberate the African minds of our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and all those that are to come after us. I've been in the New York City public school system since 1979. And every year, what I learn and what I know makes me ever more in the realization that this curriculum that we talk about is real. This is no made up ethnic cheerleading. Nothing would be more insulting to us as a people to just sit around in a room and cheerlead our ethnic group. That's called dynamic projection. In psychology, dynamic projection is when somebody projects on those whom they wish to oppress their own insecurities and deepest inferiorities. They say we want to ethnic cheerlead because there is no group on the face of this earth that cheerleads their ethnic group more than people of European descent. Freud is the father of psychology. But I have a picture of Freud's desk and he has every nature or statue of biological psychiatry that existed in the comedic mind. So how he the father of psychology when he studied comedic psychology? I've often said that people of European descent leave off a phrase, a prepositional phrase for Europe. Christopher Columbus discovered America for Europe. Freud discovered psychology for Europe. You can go through every subject. And I'm a curriculum writer and a consultant to many boards of ed. So I've seen many books in science, psychology, chemistry, physics. Johannes Kepler, born in Stuttgart, Germany, given credit for creating, inventing, the planetary laws of motion, yet he himself admits in his writing he studied the comedic golden law of planetary motion. Copernicus admits he studied comedic astronomy. In fact, anybody that knows anything in that time of history studied Egypt. Nobody, even Hitler, was a student of Egypt. Napoleon was a student of Egypt. This is not what I say, this is what they said. But what we're suffering under is a sin of omission. Part of it is commission, but a whole bunch of it is omission. It's not what they say, it's what they don't say. When we begin to teach this to our young people, and as we develop our presentation for this evening, brothers and sisters, you're going to understand that when our young people get this information, people in the Western world will be left behind by quantum leap because they will not have the intelligence to be able to test our children because they won't even understand what our children are talking about by a quantum leap. You can understand why Jackie Robinson wasn't allowed in sports. It's not that he'd ruin the neighborhood, it's that he'd create a new neighborhood. And it's not that they could not live in our neighborhood, it's that they would not be qualified to live in our neighborhood. When African folk got into sports, everything changed. They had to make baseball fields larger because black folk would just pop that ball right out the baseball field. Babe Ruth is given credit for being the king of baseball when baseball fields were very short. The baseball field of today is much larger than it was yesterday. African folk got into basketball, they had to raise the hoop. Black folk perfected the two shot, two point shot so well, they had to create three points. People say, well, what's next? Well, what's next is both. Because he's not just good in one sport, he's good in all sports. Well, that same greatness in sports, that same greatness in entertainment, 
exist because that's the only place they've allowed us to use our melanin. When we use our melanin in our minds, we will take knowledge to a level that they never even guessed. But they always feared. And this time is now. What the Dogon, what the Chemites, what the Bambara, what the Bozo were doing in Africa, the civilizations that they created were things that brought fear into the hearts of those that came, jealousy. And what we have to do and understand, we have to define some things. We have to look at certain things and understand that there is a way of looking at this knowledge that will bring an understanding. Now I know that we have the overhead projector. I would like to use that, but I've, in our center we just got the overhead projector and I'm learning how to use it. So to go between here and there might be a little bit difficult, so you may see me hesitant to go over there. I thank you for setting it up, but I don't think we're going to use it this evening. <laughs> Once I get used to it, we'll be able to do it. But I'm hoping that just in our discussion I can create pictures for you so that you can see. Some things that we would like to discuss. One of the first things that we have to do is that we have to make some definitions. We have to define some things. In order to truly understand this knowledge that we're about to discuss this evening and on March 16th, I would like to define some things to help us understand what's underneath all of this. Professor John Henry Clark, there's one thing that our elder brother taught us, me in particular which is the same thing that William Leo Hansberry taught him. And it is something that Professor Clark was one of the first things that he gave credit to William Leo Hansberry for teaching him was philosophical underpinnings. You have to understand that nothing comes to be out of itself, that there's always a natural progression. The Chemites called it Kepra. It's a process of becoming. Everything comes as a consequence of what came just before it. You cannot look at yourselves today without looking at what happened in 1620. You can't understand 1620 without understanding the Crusades. You must understand the role that the Crusades played in why we're in the position we're in today, the role that the Moors played in showing Europe what civilization was about. So you need a philosophical underpinning. You need to look at certain things to understand why things came to be. So with that, I would like to just talk about a couple of ideas. Number one, I want to give us a couple of definitions because this is at the base of all knowledge. The first thing is conjecture. Conjecture is a conclusion drawn from admittedly insufficient data. 90% of the curriculums we use built on conjecture. It is admittedly faulty, but it is put up as something else, which we'll talk about as we develop this. This information, by the way, is coming out of the research and the work of our brother, Reverend Dr. Ishaka Musa Barashango. He says that an example of a supposition, if you wanted to use a phrase, was, let us suppose that. And if you wanted to use one word, to develop a conjecture, it would be possibility. The second word that we'd like to define, supposition. Supposition is an assumption with less assurance than an hypothesis. One word would be maybe, supposition, maybe. Now let's look at the word hypothesis. Hypothesis is a temporary explanation of an occurrence based on known data, thus validating a basis for further research. An example would be, it seems to be that. It seems to be. Don't make it so, it seems to be. One word, probable. Number four would be theory. Theory comes out of the concept to observe, to see, to look at. And hypothesis is so well substantiated 
it is believed to be generally accepted. An example of a phrase would be, it appears to be that. And one word would be believable. The fifth word is science. Science is to know. Science is a body of actual facts systematically arranged and showing the operation of certain principles of natural law. Now that's the African mind right there, science. Natural law. This stuff out here is unnatural. They can get you to a conclusion, you wonder how you got there. All they did is say, hold my hand, I'll take you there. But the route you took was not natural. Therefore, it's not science. An example of this would be the law of gravity. Or, if you wanted to personify the law of gravity, Michael Jordan. You know, they often say about Michael Jordan, he defies the law of gravity. But to Africans and Native Americans, you never defy nature. When you are so in tune with ma'at, you become nature. Michael Jordan doesn't defy the law of gravity, he becomes the law of gravity. And who's going to tell the law of gravity you can't stay up in the air for 10 seconds? I just wish the brother was aware of his well-melanated state. He could stay up there all night. The sixth word is theology. The study of the concept or idea of a creative force or what we would call or who we would call God. And the final word or the next to final word is cosmology which is the study of how the universe came to be and stayed becoming. Because just because you come to be don't mean you're becoming. I know a lot of African folk who be, but they don't be becoming. You can be and not be becoming, but you cannot be becoming and not be. We here, African people, united in movement, are not just being, we are becoming. Becoming a more perfect nation, a more perfect people. And while I'd like to see great numbers of us, I know numbers don't build great nations. Commitment, dignity, integrity, and unity to purpose creates nations. The final word that we'd like to talk about is philosophy which is the love of wisdom. Philosophy being an African word as Theophilio Benga constantly teaches us, coming out of Sophia or Sophus, meaning wisdom, and philo, meaning love. They say it's Greek, but you know where the Greek got it from. All you gotta do is know that. It's like I was speaking to a brother about Schwala de Lubitz this evening, and you know, Schwala de Lubitz never said that well, who he was writing about was African folk. He knew he wouldn't make a dime if he did. So he just opened up and said what the Africans did, but never said they were Africans. So when you read his work, just know they were African people. That's the key to understanding. The sin of omission. In our schools today, we teach children a certain way. And what we notice is that we consider to be intelligence or the genius, we look at logic, which I'd like to define as math and science. It's not always defined that way, but let me give you that way for now. That's not what logic is, but let's just say logic is what we teach in math and science. And linguistics. Linguistics meaning language, whether it be reading or writing, oratory. So when we create what we call tag schools, T-A-G, talented and gifted. We normally teach science, the biologies, the chemistries, physics. We teach the math, the algebra, the trigonometry, the geometry. And we say these children are gifted. They are intelligent. We have SAT, the PSAT, a lot of folk getting rich. We have the MAT, the LSAT, the GRE, the NTE. And not one of these tests measure your intelligence. The only thing they measure is how well you take a test. 
If you wanted to do that in the beginning, why not just say, this is a test to see how well you take a test? But they don't do that. They mask, it, they mask all of this and they hide all of this behind what they call the IQ. They mask it that way because they know that if they took it on another level, they would never understand it. But what we understand is that there are multiple intelligences. And I like to call it my skill. And by my skill, I would like to define it in a certain way and then maybe I'll venture over to the overhead projector to put it down so that you can see it. M-I-S-K-I-L-L, -L, my skill. The M of my skill, a level of intelligence or brilliance where children can find themselves and do very well in life, is music. Music being rhythm, whether it be dance, song, instrument, children can find their math, their biology, their chemistry, their physics, their life and consciousness through music. It is an area that we neglect because we think it's entertainment. People of other persuasions came into African communities and saw African people dancing and they said they're having fun, not realizing they walked in on Biology 101. All right. The I of my is intrapersonal. Intrapersonal meaning your genius and your intelligence comes through self-reflection. I am a person of intrapersonal skills. In the beginning, it was forced on me, didn't necessarily want it, but I have a speech impediment. I stutter and I stammer. When I say this to our young people in our special ed classes, they say, oh no, Mr. Coleman, that's impossible. Don't sound like that to me. And what I do is I bring myself down to the level that I know that I can stutter and I stammer and I start to talk, and there are times when I cannot even finish a sentence. I never lost my shortcoming. I merely overcame and learned how to deal with it. There's a brother I used to know growing up. He had a limp. His brother used to walk like this. People used to laugh at him. He's making fun of him. As brother got older, he used to walk like this. Whole bunch of folk checking out brother man, kind of liked the way he walked. And all of a sudden, you'd see brother man walking down the street and here's all the buddies. Now, what am I saying? Brother man took a shortcoming and made it a strength. And that's what I did with my stuttering. I learned how to talk. I learned how to use my hands. You may hear me pause this evening. You may hear me stress a word. That is because I know if I don't, I'll stutter. So as brother man got his ditty bop together, I also overcame my speech impediment. I still could have it. And as I'm with our special education children, I'm still trying to figure out what that means. But I need to come back and do a whole session on that. There's an appreciation that occurs that I have for them because I know that if someone had told me when I was a young boy that I would be before you, I would never have believed them. This for me is a dream come true. But you know, there's nobody in this room that doesn't have his or her shortcoming. And you've learned how to mask your shortcoming too. 
I only speak about it to bring it to the fore to help you understand what our children in special ed are facing. They are brilliant and they are intelligent and the creative force has endowed them with a unique gift. And it is our job to find that unique gift, not tell them what it is, but allow them to find it through their own life's journey and allow them to develop that unique gift in order for them to give it back to our nation, to create the kinds of nations we had when we lived amongst ourselves. The S of skill, the intelligence, spatial, it's the visual. There's something called the magic eye. It's a photograph, a picture that you look at, and upon looking at it, it looks like colors and looks like a wonderful design. But upon closer inspection, but more importantly, upon focusing in the picture, you come to realize that there is a formed picture within that picture. Some magic eye pictures have pyramids. Some have, I've seen them with dinosaurs, with palm trees. I've seen them with children playing in schoolyards. You show it to some people, some people, I don't see it. I can't see it, why? Because they can't focus. They can't see deeper. They can only see what's up front. And that's the problems the Greeks had with the African people. They could not get deep into what they were looking at. They did not have the magic eye. They could only see what was on the surface. And as we get into the Dogon philosophy, we will call that Jiriso, knowledge from the front. In Kemet, they will call the first initiates. The K of skill represents kinesthetic or bodily movement, which could include sports, physical activity, or soul train. Because you know what them brothers and sisters do on soul train? People on American Bandstand dream about. People say them black folk can dance, can't they? It's not so much that we can dance, it's that we are within the tunes of Ma'at. We are in tune with our surroundings. Therefore, the way in which we dance, we move with the wind. We move with our surroundings. Whereas other people are in violation of their surroundings. And that's why they dance that way. That's why they sing that way. Give me their best, and I'll show you our mediocre. They say it's in the genes. It's in melanin. And melanin is in the gene. And melanin is what brought DNA into place. The second eye, or the eye of skill, is interpersonal or social, that's the politician. They can be the most ignorant people on earth, but they know how to be social. They know how to use the English language. They know how to lie. But nevertheless, interpersonal is also an area of genius because there are also many people who are very good at social and are brilliant in other areas, too. We now come down to the two L's. These two L's are the L's... Now, I've already given you five areas of brilliance and intelligence where our children and we as a people can do well. Here's where we're always tested. The first L is logic, as we defined it as math and science, and the second is linguistics, which is verbal. Now, look at all that preceded those two. And I'm saying that Africans sought to master all seven intelligences. They were good at it all. The priests and the priestesses of Africa wanted to become the highest form of living entity that they could. 
in African philosophy, which is the basis for religion, they never taught that God was outside of you or God was inside of you. They taught you that you were God. Now, there's a big difference. Because if we love God as we say we love God, we would not do to ourselves or the other gods on earth what we do by the nature of what we say. So their life's mission was to act as God would on earth in the hope that if they did it so well on earth, they would inherit the kingdom of that God upon transcendence. The way in which they presented this information was in figurative language. Now, figurative language is very important to understand because it is at the basis of the way in which we talk to one another, the way in which we deal with one another, the way in which we study and learn and do well. Let's look at figurative language. Let's look at the metaphor and the simile because that's what hip-hop is about, about the metaphor and the simile. I know there are words that you don't like. There are words that I do not like. But go beyond what they say and look at the concept they're conjuring up. I've heard too many rappers say, don't take me literally. Listen and look at what I'm saying. And if you want to find a way to do it, when you listen to Luther Campbell, when you listen to those songs that send shivers up your spine, draw a picture of what you think he's saying or she. Then you will understand from a metaphorical perspective what's being said. Metaphors and similes create rich, exciting images that convey the author's purpose and why they are even writing. They convey this purpose quickly. The challenge to us is to use our imaginations when we read them. You must try to visualize similes and metaphors. A simile, for instance, is a comparison of two things using the words like or as. For instance, she slept like a rock. Now, you could have said she was in a deep sleep, but the image that's conjured up by a rock and then giving that personality to a person, she slept like a rock. Or you might say his legs felt like rubber bands. The concept of a rubber band being so elastic and sometimes when we are faltering, when we're about to pass out, you could say they unweight that he was wavering but to say someone's legs was like rubber bands creates an image of someone's legs just shaking like a rubber band. The ants, this is the one that children like, the ants were as thick as a carpet. Children say, that's like my house. <laughs> They're so honest, let me tell you something. Their mothers and fathers were in the house, they have a heart attack. The ants were thick as a carpet. Now, I mean, you can imagine, think of a, a carpet and think of ants just on the floor. That simile creates a picture to help you understand what's being said. Metaphor. A metaphor is a comparison that states or implies its meanings rather than using the words like or as. His face was an open book. The puppy was a limp noodle. We then get from the metaphor and the simile, the other form of figurative language, which is symbols. Symbols, objects that stand for something other than themselves are called symbols. In literature, symbols can take many forms. Symbols are very powerful and can convey a lot of information in a simple story or a simple sentence. Symbols come in the forms of human beings, 
things in nature, animals, or people. I'm sorry, I should have said the first one was man-made objects. Two was things in nature, three was animals, four people. When you look at Meduneta, you're looking at symbols. They used man-made objects, such as the jet column. They used things in nature, such as the lotus plant or the papyrus plant. They used animals such as the crocodile, as Sobek, the falcon for Heru. They used the ibis bird for Tehuti. They used the dog for Impu, not to mention the cat for Bast. And they used people. They used people in Meduneta to represent divinity. They used it to show humanity. And they used humans or people to show the animal form in people. And they combined the two. So when you're watching Hercules on Saturday, and you see this thing with our, with our man's body, uh, a man's uh, forebody, and the body of a horse, well, you know where they got that idea from. Because that is their version of what Africans did when they took the head of an animal and put it on the body of a human. Or they took the body of a human and put the head of an animal. Or let me take it another way. They took the head of an animal and put it on the body of a human. It's brilliant. Meduneta, the specialization of animals. The human being is the only essence on earth that has no reason to be here. Had the trees not dwindled 25 million years ago, gorillas would comb the earth. It is only that something happened in the atmosphere that made the trees dwindle, that made some of us jump out the trees, walk on the earth, change that opposable big toe into a stability toe, which freed up our hands. We created tools. In creating tools, we started to think. and starting to think, we started to plant food. Plant food, we thought better, thought better, planted better food, and then we built the pyramids. That's why people have problems with evolution. Because when you deal with evolution, you're dealing with Africa. The only place on earth where you'll find gorilla is in the Virunga Mountains, in the central part of Africa. You have the mountain gorilla, and you have the eastern and the western lowland gorilla, all coming out of mountains, very near the mountains of the moon. I dare not say that we evolved out of gorillas, but I would dare say that we have a common ancestor. Ninety percent of what gorillas do, we do. In fact, there are some gorillas whose fingerprints might match mine. I just hope that gorilla don't get caught up when I get in trouble. The third form of figurative language is personification. When a non-human object takes on human characteristics, the author has used the literary device called personification. For instance, the sun smiled down on them. Another one, as the waves gently caress the beach. Authors use personification as a means of creating lasting images in the reader's mind. A train that roared by is a much sharper image than one that simply went by. The roaring train creates a quick, vivid impression. The flashback. The flashback. If the author writes about a past event in a character's life and in, inserts it in the current part of the story, he is using a flashback. Many times, background information about characteristics and events are conveyed to readers through the flashback. For instance, Tom's mother thought back to the time Tom received his first basketball. 
he was still in diapers. That's a flashback because she's going back into Tom's past. Then you have foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is when an event in a current situation suggests to the reader that future events will take place in the story. The author has used foreshadowing. It's a way the author lets the reader know what to expect in the later part of her story. For example, but no one who saw him play high school basketball imagined the great NBA player he would become. That is foreshadowing. Now why is this important? This is important, my brothers and sisters, because these are some of the forms that we as African people use in displaying our intelligence, the way in which we write, the way in which we talk. It is not that we, didn't, we do not talk and act and think in the literal, in the linear, but we tend to allow ourselves to go into the circuitous or the circular way or the form of writing and thinking. We are linear, but we are circuitous. And it is important that as we begin to develop our consciousness, that we begin to tap in to these kinds of ideas when we are with our children, whether they be classroom or our children or our friends' children, we need to look at the seven basic intelligences, and there are other ways you can say this. There are other ways you could say music and interpersonal, spatial, but I use this just so we can focus on something. How many times have we ever asked our children in math class to draw something? How many times do we actually ever ask them to use other parts of their intelligence other than just filling in the blanks, multiple choice, or writing essays? It's important that when we begin to talk to our children that we look at figurative language and that we understand that much of what they say and we say, we're not actually saying that. We, it's like when we say, well, you know what I mean. Well, obviously you must have used figurative language because if you had said it very linearly or straightforward you wouldn't have to say you know what I mean because you would have been obvious so when you're not obvious you use figurative language you use it in another way and this is what the texts in Africa did this is what our ancestors did when they wrote the Memphite text the Shabaka stone the pyramid text, the coffin text, the Bremerin papyrus. They said to the sun in the hymn to Aten, they said, you glorious sun who bring down your hands of life and bring forward the fruit, the vegetables and the very sustenance that humans live by. In fact, you have brought us forward and kissed our face with your life. That's personification. That's flashback. That's the metaphor. But if you read that, they will make you think that what the Africans were saying was that the sun had hands that came down and put life on earth in a literal sense. So what we have got to begin to do is to look at this information from a figurative language perspective. The hymn to our tent says, you, the mighty sun, whose eyes pierce through the air to the surface of the ocean and touch the ocean floor. There must have been some scuba divers in Kemet. How can you know that the sun rays touch the ocean floor lest you yourself have been to the ocean floor to see it for yourself? How can you write that? You can't. How do you even know that there is a floor on the ocean lest you've been there yourself? The hymn to our ten was a metaphoric text in science. It was a holistic text that said, you the sun who are the cause for the differing complexions on earth. Sounds like they knew about melanin to me. Because how do you know what would cause the different complexions if you did not do the scientific laboratorical work necessary to know of the carbon atom. 
you, the mighty Son, who are the cause for the differing languages on the earth. They must have been to many parts of the earth to know that they were differing languages. So why are we surprised that Africans are in America and in Europe and in Asia? How do you know there are different languages in other lands unless you've been to the other lands to hear those languages? This is what the hymn to our ten talks about. And it is important that as we begin to develop this, that we look at the work of Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Theophile Obenga, Dr. John G. Jackson, Drs. Chancellor Williams, and Sheikh Unta Jok, to understand that there is a cultural unity in Africa. There is a cultural tie that binds African people together, not just on the continent, but in her diaspora. That there is something very common about our brothers and sisters in Palmeiras of Brazil, in the Maroons of Jamaica, of Santeria de Puerto Rico, Republica Dominicana, of Boudin, of the French-speaking islands, and in amongst the Baptists in Georgia. There is something that binds us together that in Kennedy Airport we can pass each other and smile and nod and have a whole conversation but never say a word. You know we can do that. That's part of the genes. It's in the genes. It's in us. And what the, glori the glorious thing about Meduneta was is that Meduneta was a pictographic language which no matter what vocal language you spoke, if you understand the context or the concepts in Meduneta, you then would understand what everybody was speaking. Let me give you an example. Let's go back to Kennedy Airport. And let's look at a door. And beside the door, there's a picture of a man. No matter what country you come from around the world, you know if you're a man, you can go in there and not get arrested. Now you have another door with a woman. It doesn't say woman because out of the 150 languages, you know what, how many times you'd have to say woman? All you have to do is put a picture there. That is what Meduneta was. Ghostbusters, you got that circle with the line through. It means that whatever is in that circle, you don't do. That's Meduneta. That is where they got it from. No matter what language you speak, if you get on a bus and in that circle it has a cigarette, it has food, it has a radio, you know that's what you can't do. You may speak a different language. Maybe everybody on the bus may speak a different language, but everybody on the bus know no smoking, no eating, no radio playing. Meduneta, figurative language. These are the keys to understanding our past. Metaneta is not a mystery. It's a mystery to those who can't figure out the language. It's no mystery to us. And as we begin to develop and understand and teach our children, we will be able to decipher the words of our ancestors. As Theophile Obenga has done so well, Sheikh Abdul Jop has done so well, our sister Raketty Wimby is doing so well. Roosevelt Robinson is doing a magnificent job. Jacob Carruthers, who graced this stage this year. Mawalana Karenga. All of these scholars are doing very important work. And once we get our children here, they'll be telling us things they see that we don't see. Because there's a very special relationship between the young and the old. That's why it was so important that the grandparents raised the children while the parents went off and maintained the society. In Congo, in Kikongo, the language, it is called Kindesi, the art of babysitting. Because as our brother Maladoma Some teaches us, Burkina Faso, of water and the spirit, 
that the reason why the relationship between grandchild and grandparents is so sacred is because one has just come from the ancestors and the other is on his way back to the ancestors. And together they have a unique relationship where they talk about ancestors. And so that when they come of age to begin to develop the civilization, then they will understand the ancestral line and what the ancestors are actually telling them. You know, if you knock at somebody's door and you don't get no answer, eventually you're going to knock on someone else's door. And that's what our ancestors are doing to us. You see, fortunately for us, for you, and I believe for me, we've answered our ancestors' door. That's why we're here. We have brothers and sisters out here who the ancestors are knocking on them hard heads and nothing's getting through. And at this stage of my life, all I can tell you is that a flood is coming and if you don't get on this boat, you're gonna drown. Reminds me of the story of the brother who was standing and they were told it was gonna be a very serious flood. Brother said, don't worry about it because Amin Ra is gonna save me. The rain started coming, got up to his knees. Somebody came by and said, look now, it's gonna be flood. You're going to drown. Blood said, don't worry about it. I have faith in Amun Ra. He's going to save me. Another boat came by just as the water was just up by his nose. Boat came by, said, look, man, you better jump on board. You're going to drown. Blood said, don't worry about it. Amun Ra is going to save me. Well, needless to say, the water went above his head. Brother drowned and went up to a mentor. And when he confronted Amin Ra, he said, Amin Ra, I had great faith in you. I believed you was going to save me. Amin Ra said, shut up. I sent three boats after you. <laughs> you think that brother missed the boat? Well, that's what's happening out here amongst us, my brothers and sisters. Our ancestors are tapping and they're telling us there's going to be a flood. And I like scripture, no matter what holy book it is. No matter what it is, it tells us something. I may not view it as revelatory, but it is part of the ancestral line. And I kind of like what James Baldwin said. In fact, he named the book after it because God gave Noah the rainbow sign. He said, there'd be no more water. It's going to be the fire next time. Our streets are in flames, and it is up to us to make a difference. The cultural unity in Africa is not only linguistic, not only philosophical, it is also historic. It binds us as a people historically, linguistically, and philosophically. It is important that we see this and know this and look at the work of Sheikh Ante Diop and others who have come before us so that we can begin to develop the kinds of information that will allow us to see this information for what it's really telling us. Because much of what's written on the walls of ancient Kemet applies to us today. Particularly if you go to Abu Simbel and you go into the tomb, or I should say into the temple of Abu Simbel, and you look at the Battle of Kadesh that Ramses II is talking about. Holistically speaking, this Battle of Kadesh is not just with outside people. It is not just with your own people. It is with yourself. The Battle of Kadesh was a multi-referential story of how we could liberate ourselves. And what Ramses was trying to tell us and his scholars were trying to tell us was that the first person that you must defeat is the Satesh within yourself. Before you go out here and you're going to save the world, go into your bathroom and look in the mirror because most of the time your first enemy is yourself. The Shabaka stone. The Shabaka stone 
was written by Pharaoh Shabaka during the 25th dynasty. We could give it dates. I'm kind of afraid to give it dates, but let's give it a date of approximately 710 BC. Approximately. Somewhere around there. Again, I'm hesitant about dates because when our children begin to decipher this, our civilizations will go back so far, they'll have to rewrite a whole new timeline. But for now, let us just give the dates we have something to focus on. The Shabaka stone was written or it was given orders by Pharaoh Shabaka to rewrite the Memphite text when in coming through Kemet, along Happy, they came into Memphis or what they call Hikupata, H-I-K-U, Pata, P-T-A-H. And in Hikupata, they came upon a worm-eaten papyrus that told of the beginnings of the universe. And Shabaka was so taken back by this wonderful information, he was taken back by the fact that what was written on that papyrus was as applicable to the 25th dynasty as it was to the early dynasties. He said, we must rewrite this. And what's interesting is that more time elapsed between the old kingdom and the 25th dynasty than between the 25th dynasty and today. So if it is applicable then, it's applicable now. And when I've gone into our science texts, I have seen that the Memphite text is as relative today as it was in the Old Kingdom and the 25th dynasty. And I'm going to show you why. Because coming out of a philosophical underpinning using figurative language, using symbols and personification, the metaphor, the simile, and flashback with foreshadow, what the Chemites did is that they outlined three philosophies. The primate of the essences, the essences of pre-existing order and arrangement, which they call the gods of chaos. They call them that, not the Chemites. And the essences of order and arrangement. The same way that we teach our children today the universe came into being is the same way the Shabaka stone lays this out what is today called the quantum theory. The quantum theory being everything from the skin in. So you have relativity skin out, which is the atmosphere, the universe, the solar systems, the galaxies, superclusters and clusters. And you had the quantum theory, which was the skin in, which meant the atom inside of your body. Einstein died saying he never found it. But as we said earlier, the waters of Nun were the equations of the unified field theory. Now here's the key. Chemites said there are some things that are unseen. They said there are some things you'll never see. But in the Western world, they don't believe that. So they'll come and tell you, I've seen the unseen. I tell them, you're crazy. Because if it was unseen, you couldn't see it. Obviously, if you see it, it's not that it's unseen, it's just that you didn't see it before. But it was always there to be seen. African folks said, there is the unseen, I know I will never see it, Therefore, I'm not going to try to bring into being a mathematical equation that's going to explain the unseen because I've never seen it and there's no equation that's going to see it. So let's just leave it alone and move on from there. So they said everything and all was in unity in the waters of Nun. And at some point in cosmic history, something occurred which we call the primordial scission that rising up out of the waters of Nun there came Ptah as a hill. Now, what are they saying? Out of the waters of Nun, rising through Ptah, sitting atop Ptah, came Atum. Now, and Atum named and called everything into being. Now, let's go back to Nun, and let's look at what it means on the cosmic level. Nun, on a cosmic level, is the cosmic ocean. 
It is the hydrogen that makes up our universe. On the earthly level, when they told it from an earthly perspective, Nun represented the primordial waters of the earth. When they spoke about it on a human level, they were talking about matter. Let's go to Patar. On a cosmic level, what Patar represented was spirit. On an earthly level, the hill that rose up out of the waters represented the land that came up out of the primordial oceans. And on the human level, Patar represented not just a conversion of energy from kinetic, I'm um, sorry, from potential energy, which is energy at rest, to kinetic energy, energy in motion, but it also was mummified. Now, why is it mummified? Why would Patar always be looked upon as a mummy? Well, let's look at metamorphosis. And let's look at what happens to the human being. But before we look at the human being, let's look at the butterfly. Butterfly is a greedy little thing. It eats, 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 eats everything. Don't care about nothing but eating. But in its eating, it eats only certain things so that it could spin the proper kind of cocoon that they then will go into, or are already in, but spin the cocoon around them in order to come forward as a butterfly. They literally transcend or transform themselves into an earthbound creature, into a creature that can fly, which is why mummification came to be. Because in mummifying and wrapping the body in the in the linen, the Chemites were reenacting the animals, particularly the caterpillar that goes into a cocoon, and in a number of days, three, according to our Christian belief, you resurrect yourself. That's why Jesus the Christ was wrapped in linen, because they were reenacting his comedic legacy of mummification. Think about it. Naeem Akbar has written a book on metamorphosis of this level. Think about it. See, I always come before the community and I never say you gotta believe what I say. It is my job to share the information with you. But the research I've done is so, so intact to what I'm saying, I know that when you get to the book, you'll come to similar conclusions. Many of you will come to higher conclusions, which I ask for you to share with me, because you can teach me, because this information is so dynamic. I'm very confident, and I'm confident because it makes sense according to ma'at, a natural law. That's why our children learn this way, because it's natural. Now let's look at our tomb. Our tomb on the cosmic level is the word it is that which calls everything and all into being. On the earthly level, our tomb is organic life, whether it be chlorophyllian or melanin. And on a human level, our tomb represents consciousness. Now what our tomb does is he calls four pairs into being, and these four pairs are very important for two reasons. Number one for planetary science, but number two for the Dogon, because the Dogon have a very similar story. Atum calls into being Nun. Now, remember, Nun was in the beginning, but Nun did not know himself. So Nun had to manifest something that would know himself and call him into being. If you look at the holy books, you will see that God was spirit who had to manifest flesh to know God's self. That's where they got the philosophy that on the spiritual level, the spirit cannot know self. Therefore, it must, in science, it's called coagulate. It must coagulate in order to know itself on a material level, and that's our job as human beings, is our consciousness to the godlike quality. Called nun, which is water, nunet, 
which was space, ha, which is infinity, hahet, which is infinity, kok, which is darkness, koket, which is light, amen, which is the invisible, and amenet, which is the visible. That which I just gave you, nununet, ha, ha, het, ka, ka, het, and amen, amenet, that is the second philosophy or the essences of pre-existing order and arrangement. At this point in time, the story goes into the third philosophy, this is the Memphite text of the Shabaka stone, where Atum joins him herself to Kepra, and so Kepra becomes Atum Kepra, or the process of becoming, which means that it transcends into another level of consciousness which brings forward the next four pairs. Again, four pairs. Again, male, female. God is not just a man. God is a divine balance of male and female. I'll, I honestly believe we shall liberate ourselves when we understand that God is not just a man. The cornerstone to the problem of Western civilization is that their man does not know his own mother. And in not knowing his mother, he grows to curse the womb from whence he came. And you cannot amount to anything in life if you ever curse the womb from whence you came. And it is important for us as an African people we as African males are not talking superiority or inferiority. We are not saying, we are not attempting to put our sisters, our mothers, our aunts, our female on a pedestal. We are merely trying to stand next so that we can move forward. Because if you put the sister on a pedestal, she cannot move forward because she's up on a pedestal. So we got to stand together as men We've got to understand that we are half women. The depiction of Nun is a man with a breast that is pouring forward nourishment and is pregnant, but it's a man because the Chemites understood that to be on this earth, you in and of itself are the emanations of God by being the balance of the male and female that brings you forward and in bringing you forward you then personify and create the Trinity so each human being is a Trinity you are mother you are father but you are also the unique combination of mother and father you are not all mother you are not all father. You are you, but you still are mother and father. Therefore, you are and have created the original trinity. These four pairs bring forward the essences of order and arrangement. Bring forward Shu, which is air, Tefnut, which is moisture. Shu, Tefnut, bring forward Nut, which is sky, Geb, which is earth. Interesting story is that Shu looks down and sees that Nut and Geb are in a lover's embrace. Shu comes down and separates Nut from Geb, and Nut is pregnant. Now, in many of our stories, we look at Mother Earth, but Geb is a male. Why? Because figuratively speaking, they were not saying that the Earth brought forward the human being. It's the sun that brought forward the Earth that sh shining on the earth brought forward organic life. Therefore, Nut swallows not just the sun at night, but the energy of the sun, translating it into starlight, which is written all over her body. And in the morning at dawn, she brings forward the sun again to create the day which is a figurative story. Now, if you want to get to the story and look at it literally, you got a fairy tale. But if you look at it figuratively, 
you've got astronomy 202. Newton Gibb, bring forward a saw, a set, nebetet, setesh. A saw, a set, bring forward heru. Now, what is so important about this? Now I'm ready to talk about this evening's presentation. <laughs> I know the hours we keep at the slave. But now you can see why I had to put this into two parts. Because I've got to give you this background information to understand from whence the Dogon came. Because the Dogon themselves claim to have come from the great waters of the East. But not just that, it's so important to understand that the ancient civilizations of Ghana, Mali, Songhai, Mali, the Malinke Empire itself, comprised Senegambia, Burkina Faso, Mali, all these areas. Yet we are told today that with the spread of Islam, they created the University of Timbuktu. Now, people that don't look like the indigenous people are going to leave their land to create a great university in a land unknown to them. Why didn't they go back from whence they came? Or why aren't those centers of higher learning there? Why? Because they didn't exist there. It is because in the University of Timbuktu and because in Kemet, that is where the knowledge was. And that's why after the prophet, blessings and peace on that African brother's name, transcended, the first place they went was to Kemet. And they created what today is called alchemy. They created it? Oh no, I don't think so. They learned it. And then they taught it to others. That's why you gotta understand the crusades. Because after Africans taught them, the Africans took it into Europe. And then they taught it in Europe. They brought spices from the east from whence they had traveled to Europe. Europeans got hooked on something. Got hooked on sugar. That's why the Crusades occurred. Because they were looking for something in the east. So under the pretense of attempting to return the Holy Land to the Christians, they traveled east, and they called it the Crusades. The number eight is very important. Four pairs are very important because, although we learn it in class, there are not nine planets. There are eight. Pluto is not a planet because Pluto now is no longer the furthest planet from the sun. Neptune is. But they don't tell you that because if they told you that, then they have to tell you a number of other things too. And the first thing is that they're wrong. Native Americans have a story about them. Native Americans say, you don't have to tell the European anything. You already know it all. You have four inner planets separated by an asteroid belt and you have four outer planets. The four inner planets, because of their proximity to the sun, take on a more solid, surface, these planets being Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Then come an asteroid belt. After that, you have Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune. Revolving around Neptune is Pluto. The four outer planets are called gas giants. Pluto is in a category all by itself. It is not a planet. A lot of people are not going to admit that because they already wrote the science books. And they'd either have to put an errata page in it, correcting their mistake, or they'd have to rewrite the books. And there's something that a very serious problem ignorant people have. They refuse to admit they're ignorant. Out of this concept, African people flowed across Africa, flowed across the West, flowed across all sorts of areas, 
and brought their civilization, their knowledge from inner Africa, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, up happy and down happy, into Monomotapa, into South Africa, into North Africa, and across into West and Central Africa. It is here in the Malinke Empire, around the 11, the 12, and the 1300s, that a great and wonderful university was created. It's called Timbuktu. It was built on other universities that had been there before the Christian era. It was here in the Malinke Empire that they passed down from years past this knowledge. When, Miss, when Monsieur Griot and Madame Dittelaine, the authors of The Pale Fox, first studied under the Dogon, the Dogon brought them into a temple. And what they did is they showed them how long they had known this knowledge of what they called the Sigue, S-I-G-U-I, which was a 60-year cycle of celebration that celebrated Sirius and understood the movement of what is called an invisible star. That it wasn't until the 1970s that we actually could see through a photograph. It was first seen in the late 1800s. But the Dogon people knew of this hundreds of years prior. And to celebrate this Sigwe, they would create what is known as a Kanaga mask. K-A-N-A-G-A, -A -A, Kanaga mask. So every 60 years, the Dogon built one mask. In this room where they brought these Europeans, there were 12 masks. If you multiply 12 times 60, you get 720. If you subtract it from 1931, when they got this information, you get 1211. That is how long the Dogon people knew this serious star that was invisible to the naked eye or their naked eye was. Africans knew this, 1211. But to know it, 1211 is only the tip of the iceberg. It's only the fin of the shark. And if you're in the water and you see a fin, you're not worried about the fin you worried about what that fin's connected to. When you're in that water on a boat heading towards an iceberg, you're not worried about what you see. You're worried about what's underneath the iceberg. So if 1211 is when they had a mask, the Dogon people would have had to have known this information thousands of years before 1211, just by the nature of the process of intelligence. You don't just wake up one day and know something. You must live it. You must, mis you must make mistakes living in it, correct those mistakes, and then get it right. That's the process of intellectual growth. So if the Kanaga masks go back 12 seats, 720 years, you know the Dogon celebrated this long before then. The Dogon told a story of no more. No more in Dogon is interchangeable with the, war, with the word water. Now look how close no more is to noon. Word. What brought word in the water was Ama. Ama. Atum. Amen, Amenet. Now, mind you, they already said they came from the east of the great waters. Put that aside. Now let's look at the philosophical underpinnings of their story. The Dogon occupy a territory situated at the border between Mali and Burkina Faso. It is near the bend of the vast plains of the Niger River. The Dogon experienced four months of a rainy season, and they also have a very long dry season. The Dogon lived 
in four villages. Their clans or their family lines are broken up into four. And their entire philosophy is wrapped around what they call twinness or the concept of male-female. They believe in the four elements. There are, of course, as I said, four main nations. They have developed a very intricate way of growing eight different cereal grains. The Dogon basically are farmers, and their agriculture is the basis of their economy. Yet everything that they live in math and science and every other subject expresses itself through agriculture. Sirius B. Sirius B is a tiny star that rotates around Sirius A every 50 years. The Dogon call it Kizi Uzi, K-I-Z-I-U-Z-I, Kizi Uzi, which means the littlest seed. They have a grain that they call bowl. This bowl is looked upon like Kiziuzi. It is the representation on the agricultural level of Kiziuzi because while it is the smallest grain in their possession, it is the most important and it is the center of their agricultural life. Just as they believe that Kiziuzi is the center of the universe, they believe that Kizi Uzi, and by the way, we call in science today, we call Kizi Uzi a dwarf star. It is a star that is so heavy that a thimbleful weighs 80 tons. Think about it now. You took a thimbleful of the matter of what Sirius B is made of. This matter, by the way, amongst the Dogon is called Sagala, S-A-G-A-L-A. -A. It is so dense, a thimbleful would weigh 80 tons. The Dogon raise domestic animals. Meat is rarely consumed, thank God, except on market day. Families, I should, I'm sorry, fruits are gathered from cultivated and wild trees Honey is collected, and vegetable oils are prepared. But the key to all that we say is to understand how this nation operates. There are approximately 250,000 people that comprise the Dogon Nation. The first inhabitants of the region were known as a very short-statured people, which should bring to mind the short-statured people of Central Africa, and they are called Kurumba. But the Dogon call them Telem, T-E-L-L-E-M, which to me, if you were to look at that word Telem, means just that, Telem. Because they are the ones, if anyone can tell them, they can tell them. The Dogon claim to also come and to have derivatives amongst the Mande people. This region extends from the west of Bamako which is the site of the ancient Mandingo Empire of Keiti, which is also called Mali. It dominated a great part of West Africa in the 13th century. But more importantly than that, look at the Dogon and remember what I said about the nations of, Mal uh, of the Malinke Empire and you will see that the Mandingo, the Bambara, the Bozo, the Makin, and the Fulbe people were all organized under Sundiata. I want to round this out. And I want to give us headway into the next piece. But I'd like to tell you of what I brought with me this evening. I've brought some videotapes and I've brought some curriculum guides. But not just that, I have and I'm selling a picture of the Shabaka stone. And the reason why I'm doing this for our community is because I believe that 
When we go out and we argue, we debate if we choose to, you must have physical proof of your primary source. I have researched and found the Shabaka stone in the British Museum. I have a picture of it of which I have reproduced. And this evening, if you are interested, I have a picture of the Shabaka stone. It is important to know it, to see it, to be able to read it, and to know how it is comprised. It is important for you to know that this exists, that when you're discussing it, that you know it's here, that you can take it out and show somebody, this is my primary source. Along with that, I have an onx. Call it the onk clip. The onk clip can be used as a money clip or a tie clip. But it came to be one day I was reading Essence magazine and I became very concerned about what I saw. I saw Elizabeth Taylor selling our culture. And I said to myself, we can do that. I brought together an African graphic artist, sister by the name of Rashida Imam Brown, and I brought together twin brothers, Dwayne and Wayne Reese, who put together the concept of this and we commissioned 200. We have some left. I don't sell them to everybody. I sell them only to us, because I think only us know what to do with it. Brother says, let me tell you something. You might wonder why I'm doing it now as opposed to Kwanzaa, but it came to me as a Kwanzaa idea. And it came to me as a Kwanzaa idea because I don't mean to send a bad word out because I'm the first one for cooperative economics. I spend my money with my people. And I let people know I, I look for my people. You know what I'm saying? And when I start a business as I did with this unk, I look for my people. I'm not shy, I'm not shy nor ashamed to say it because I'm selfish for survival. But what I saw happening down at Jacob Javis, from the moment I gave someone that didn't look like me my money, I knew he was in trouble. I have nothing against what happened there, but call it Black Christmas. Don't call it Kwanzaa Expo, because that's not Kwanzaa. The reason why I'm selling these onks now is because I am hoping that in the idea of Kwanzaa, that they become something that you will cherish, that you will find to be important, that you will want to hand down to your descendants. Just as grandmother handed down the brooch to granddaughter when she would come to the house and always go into grandma's seated chest. You know that chest that smells like wood? Always go through every time she visit grandma down south. Just say, grandma, I won't go to the chest. She go take out grandma's old clothes and her hats but this one brooch was something very special. And every time grandma knew that they were coming, she would know that granddaughter would be wearing the brooch for the two weeks that she was visiting or for the summer. And so one Christmas morning, the grandchild celebrating Christmas would open up a gift from grandmother and in that box would be that brooch, the handing down of a legacy. The reason why I only brought 200 into being is because I'm not a jeweler and I don't ever plan on doing this again. I will do no more onks. That is a guarantee. That is why with every onk, we have a number of things. We have a two-page information sheet on what the onk is in universal civilizations. And we have a certificate of authenticity where each onk has been numbered one to two hundred so that when you give your onk to your great-grandchild, please give this certificate also to make this something to be handed down. The price is $35. The reason why it is the price that it is is because I wanted to make it affordable to the community. So many times we do wonderful things, but we charge $500.
I was selling the arms at one point for $54. And I was giving a presentation, and a mother came to me with a child and said, you know, I really would like one of my arms for this child, but I just can't afford $54. I said, well, my sister, how much can you afford? She said, well, I could afford $35. So at that moment in time, I changed the price from 54 to 35. For our community, not for those who have, but for those who might not have that much, but are willing to spend a collected amount of money on something that they hold to be valuable. It is important that as we develop our psyche, we develop our minds, we develop all those things that are so important to us that we develop a gradation of intelligence. In closing, I would like to talk about these levels of intelligence. When young African children in the Dogon Nation first came before the master teacher, they learned what is called Jidi So. Jidi So is the emanation of Amma, remember Amma is the word, is the emanation of Amma from the front. It is the word on the front. It is the word of the instructor. It is the perceptual. It is the unconscious. Because our children in many ways are unconscious of their consciousness. As years went on, and the students studied, they then were raised to the level of Beniso, B-E-N-E-S-O, Beniso. Beniso is the word on the sides, which become the protector words, the words of protection, which after you get the words from the front, you get the words on the side, the confidence of knowledge. As years went on and the student was perceptive and studied hard, they went from Beniso to Boloso. Boloso is the word from the back, the word that you might not be able to see, but is there if you were to turn around. Boloso. Boloso is a combination of the knowledge of Beniso and Jidiso. Now when you got heavy, when you became of age, the Chemites would have called them the sons and daughters of light. You were said to become part of So, Dai, So, S-O, Dai, D-A-Y-I. So, Dai represented the word from the inside, the word of the spirit, the word of intuition, the word of mother wit, the word of cosmic consciousness, the word that Martin Luther King spoke on April 3rd, 1968. The word that says and prophesizes what you see on the mountaintop, knowing that you will not get there, but wanting your people to know that night that they and we as a people will get to the promised land. That is so Sodai personified. Our ancestors possessed Sodai. They knew they'd be free. Harriet Tubman was Sodai personified. For if she thought that European supremacy was on earth for good, she never would have freed herself. Because she would have said, for what? As we are in our communities, my brothers and sisters, and as we see so many terrible things that I know we see, I want you to let the spirit of Harriet embrace you and to kiss your face, to let you know that if that sister could do it then, who are we to complain now? That sister, frail in morphology, 
giving in sometimes to fainting spells unannounced. I hear people say in Harlem, I'm going to take a cab to 135th Street. They're on 125th Street, they tired. You want your freedom? Look at Harriet. She walked from south to north. That sister wanted to be free. There were no cabs. There were no trains for her. And at the point that sister found her way up to the, to the north, I would have said, Sister Harriet, you've done well. Rest yourself. She said, hush up, child, I'm going back south. Sister picked herself back up, frail in nature, given to fainting spells, not knowing when she would pass out, knowing that there was a price on her head. She was really willing to return to the south over 16 times. Had the sister done it once, I would have said that was great. Had she just freed herself, I would have said that's a miracle. Sister did it 16 times and freed over 300 African folk. So, that's for Harriet. So when I'm tired, or I think I'm tired, Harriet comes and shakes my shoulder and says, child, if I could do it then, hush your mouth now. Get up and do what you have to do. No matter what it looks like out there, if Harriet Tubman thought that her conditions were permanent, she would never have left. Too many people use the excuse that you're not gonna make a difference. Who are you as one person? Who was Harriet as one person? Look at what she did. Look at what William Leo Hansberry did. Look at what he was able to do in the area of education for our people. He stood alone when some of the finest minds in America, African included, tried to tear him down. But the brother stood fast against the winds of ignorance because brother knew that if one tells truth and a million tells lies, the one is in the majority. So we've got to pick up this knowledge and take it forward. On March 16th, First World Alliance, 141st Street and St. Nicholas Avenue, we will have fellowship with the African community and we will be doing part two of this unity of African philosophy as expressed by Dogon culture. We will really get deep into the Dogon. We will talk about their philosophy. We will talk about Sirius A and Sirius B and Sirius C. We will talk about astronomy and the importance of astronomy in knowing self. Because when Africans said, know thyself, they weren't just talking about knowing yourself. They were saying to know yourself in relationship to everything else that exists in the cosmos. It is important that as we come together as a community that we share the knowledge that we know, that we do it in a most beneficent way we do it in a very humble way. Now when I use that word humble, I don't mean humble the way they define humble. Because all of us must know our greatness. But our greatness does not make us greater than other people. It is important that as we learn this and teach this and move forward that we remain strong as our ancestors. Because we're not inventing strength. We're merely replicating what we see already. And brothers and sisters, as Dr. King has told us, as Malcolm has taught us, as the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey taught us, and as one of the greatest prophets that ever lived, the Honorable Bob Marley, sang to us, we shall overcome by any means necessary. We are a people who will rise by the will of our wills because no one can curse who Jah has blessed. And by the very fact that we're still on this earth in the slave theater, doing what we're doing, the creator force has blessed us and has a job for us. And we must carry the torch across the field into the promised land for those yet unborn. Brothers and sisters, Shemem Hotep Amun is satisfied.
Professor Booker J. Coleman. Let's give him a round, warm applause. Thank you very much for that informative presentation tonight. Thank you very much. Professor Booker T. Coleman, one more time. Let us hold hands and affirm our Africanness to each other. And as we are grabbing somebody's hand, let us remember that Saturday, all UAM members, it's very important that you wake up and come out and assemble and put African minds together. We waiting on you, Hilly, to grab somebody's hand. I hope you grab the hand of somebody you like. We're an African people, robbed from our homeland, robbed of our names, our languages, our cultures, our religions, our selfhood, our nationhood, our womanhood, our manhood, our sisterhood, our brotherhood, our motherhood, our fatherhood, and our self-respect. But we shall rise, never to fall again. Up, ye mighty race, you can accomplish what you will, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace. Hug the person again and let them know you still love them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.